I'm Jay Kingley, co-founder and CEO of Maven, your host of Fractionals Unplugged. I'm joined today by Ross Stockdale, a fractional CMO who helps SMB, that's small mid-market businesses, who are B2B service companies, grow profitably in 12 months or less by taking owners out of the marketing seat and into the investor seat. Ross is based in Lebanon, Pennsylvania. Welcome, Ross. Thanks for having me, Jay. I'm excited to do this podcast with you. Welcome to Fractionals Unplugged, an insider's perspective vodcast and podcast from Maven. You've left the corporate executive world to build your own business to secure your income, savor your independence, and succeed on your terms. But you have to get past the struggles of acquiring clients, building a pipeline, and getting paid what you're worth. In this podcast, Jay Kingley, the CEO of Maven, and his guests share their best practices, tips, and tricks on how you can get out of Struggle City and into Success City and beyond. Enjoy today's episode. Ross, I'm the CEO of a $20 million company that provides a suite of office services to commercial buildings throughout central Pennsylvania. I'm looking to take my business to the next level. We bump into each other for the first time at a business conference. You've got a maximum of 60 seconds to give me your elevator pitch. Go. CEO, I'm going to ask you a couple rapid fire questions while you think about it. And if they got you thinking and challenging your POV, reach out to me after this. Can you define what next level looks like? What do you plan to do differently between now and the future date to get there? Does it involve you working more in your business? If you don't have someone to spearhead your strategy and team, how likely is it you'll succeed? Think about that. Get back to me. Here's my contact details. And if you want help, hey, I'm a phone call away. So Ross, who do you serve in terms of your ideal client and your target market? My ideal client, as you said, Jay, are small business owners of service companies. They do between $1 and $30 million a year in top line revenue, but they're looking to grow profitably. So typically, the owner is working in the business. It's usually the founder, and they want to get more bang for their buck when it comes to looking at marketing as not just an expense, but an investment. And they also want to work less and get paid more. So give me an example of what a B2B service company that you would serve would look like. Like What type of services are they providing? So I've worked with marketing agencies in the past that provide marketing as a service for other businesses. I've also worked at uh, SaaS and IT consulting companies. I've worked with manufacturers that provide product to wholesalers. Those are a couple of the, the different verticals. But B2B is the most important aspect. So why do your clients need what you do? I look at it at three psychological reasons. The first is they're frustrated. They've owned their business because they solve client problems, but they don't see marketing as an investment. They look at it as an expense and they avoid it like the plague. Or they've been burned in the past by marketers or marketing agencies, and they just don't really trust marketers in general. <clears throat> Another pain point my clients have typically is complacency. They've been around for a couple of decades and experienced success, but with the incoming of technology and the way that the market has shifted, uh, they've been finding it harder and harder to keep up doing the things that they used to do to get them to where they're at. So if they're above a million, you know, congratulations, you've been more successful than most small businesses ever have. However, they want something more. They've hit a ceiling. And they don't know what it is or how to get there. And the third pain point that I find the most often is they're over leveraged, which means they've either gotten into debt, their line of credit is getting close to maxed out, or they're in time debt where the owners are working so much in their business, they don't have time to do anything else in their life. Um, they work seven days a week, 365 days a year. And the more they do, the more they feel like they're falling behind. So whether it's with monetary or time, they're over leveraged and they're getting burned out. So what outcomes can your clients expect when they work with you? Three outcomes that all my clients have reported having are clarity, focus, and confidence. Clarity on what to do, who to do it with, how long it'll take, ROI expectations, which channels and messaging 
making decisions. Oftentimes, when people are feeling frustration or complacency, it's a, it's a symptom of anxiety. There's too many choices and they don't know which choices to commit to. So not only do I help them make a decision, but I hold them accountable in their organization to committing to that decision. Another one is focus. A key facet of strategy is with unlimited time and unlimited money, and unlimited resource, you can do anything. But all of those things are limited for small business owners that I talk to. So it's how do you make the most out of your time, your money, your team? And I focus on the most impactful campaigns to get them closer to their goal and where they want to be in their ideal future. And the third result that I provide for my clients is confidence. Confidence is not just a logical understanding that, yeah, it makes sense. These plans are great, but it's a a heartfelt buy-in into the future can be better than today. So it's breaking any limiting belief or um, uh, experience they've had that thinks that they're stuck or that there's no hope. It's a solid plan, ruthlessly executed, solves most problems. So either they don't have a solid plan already or they're not executing to where they need to be. So why do you think these B2B services companies in the 10 to $30 million range are struggling to get rid of the pain points that you talked about so that they can get the outcomes they want on their own without help? I look at the, the one to 10, 10 to $30 million range as being a transformative period. Because you're no longer a solopreneur, mom and pop shop, very small town business, but you're not that $100 million, $50 million plus that has a swath of resources and huge authority in your marketplace and you know seven-figure budgets for marketing. So oftentimes, these companies fall into a place where they've achieved a certain level of success on their own. And they feel really good about their competency because they've achieved this success. However, what got you there to where you're at will not necessarily get you to where you want to be because in order for things to change, things have to change. And everyone, I believe, as a business owner is their own bottleneck in some way, but it's unpackaging that and figuring out why that is, how so. So... I find that a lot of the companies that I talk to have surrounded themselves with more or less uh, yes people that are buying into the status quo because they want job security. But by hiring a fractional executive, my job is to tell you no more than it is to tell you yes. And that's the value of breaking you free in growth is making you face uncomfortable things from the outside looking in. Everybody, including the companies that you serve have a list of things that they would say are important, but it's only a small subset of those things that can actually be urgent. And as you know, the um, things that are important, but not urgent, we like to complain about them, but we don't have the bandwidth to get rid of them. So what is it about the companies you work with that makes these issues urgent in addition to important? So typically, people don't reach out to me and are ready to sign unless they've had their own almost rock bottom experience. Um, A quote I love is, you can't read the label from inside the bottle, which I take to mean typically when something's wrong, it's hard to self-diagnose. And that something wrong can be you know, the bank is knocking on their door and saying, you need to change something or you're going to break covenant with us. Or they're losing more customers than they're gaining, but they're working harder than ever. Or they're getting in a marital issue with their spouse or their kids are starting to sort of stray away because there's not enough time. So typically these struggles are both urgent and important is that they put them off long enough Because uh, time usually does not solve real problems. Um, Addressing the problems does. And they're finally ready to address the problems because they're tapped out on their stress, whether that be financial or time or relational. And they don't know who to turn to, but they're absolutely ready to make a change because of some rock bottom event. So what are some examples of rock bottom events? 
I have a couple. One, one example was I talked to a business owner that had a note from the bank that said they were in a uh, workout. So in other words, they broke the covenant with the bank. They, their debt to service ratio was off. They were not making profitability metrics. Things were starting to go south. So they needed to make a change within 90 days or else the bank was going to pull their funding and they had to go out in the street and find a new banking relationship, which in, in this client's case has been not the first time. So when you're in business for 50 years, this is a really hard pill to swallow. Uh, that's an example of a rock bottom. Another example uh, that I've faced is you know, clients that have invested hundreds of thousands of dollars their entire marketing and have zero to show for it. And they have to report to their company yet again at the state of the company and say, we didn't grow. In fact, we shrank and we lost money this year. And the pain and the embarrassment and the shame of reporting this was enough for them to make a change. And the last example that I can think of top of my head is a client that had key employees leave, whether they had to fire them or whether they, they, they quit. Um, which made key customers leave. So they didn't really have the infrastructure of the team that they had to rely on, nor did they have any systems, processes, or any idea of how to dig out of this hole with losing both employees and customers. You know, a lot of times, Ross, the pain that people have has at its core a root cause that isn't obvious to them. In other words, they're focused on their symptoms, not on understanding what's causing those symptoms, because you can't treat symptoms and get a cure. You got to get to the root cause. So I want you to think about and share your insight into the underlying root causes that are causing these issues that your clients are dealing with, you know, some, some of these disastrous events that are really wake up calls. So what insight do you have? that either your clients don't understand or they think that the cause is something that's not really the truth. What can you share with us? That's my favorite question you've asked so far, Jay. Um, I have a couple of things to say before I dive into it. The first one is treating symptoms is like taking a painkiller and expecting your injury to go away. Yeah, you're managing the pain, but it's still there. You're just masking it. And I look at a lot of marketing agencies and, and marketers that do these the trendy tricks and tactics to get things in the door as, as painkillers, as addressing symptoms of we don't have enough leads or we need more customers. And typically, my target market, that's between 1 and 30 million, um, has done a decent enough job of getting customers in the door and promoting themselves and selling and marketing. That's not usually the, the root cause. But surgery is painful at the time, but provides a uh, solution to an injury or a an, an disease. And that's usually put off until it, it needs to be done. But once you actually heal the root problem, then you can really grow and get back to healthy. So I'm more of the surgeon versus the uh, pain pill peddler. I think we challenge all the beliefs that we hold, except those the ones we hold the most dearly. These business owners look at their business as their child, and everyone wants to have the, the belief that their child is special snowflake and perfect, and they've done nothing in terms of raising their child to make it you know, get into trouble. So to get into the, the root cause, the insight is usually it's the product, not the marketing and the sales of the business. So in other words, how I've fixed this in the past for other clients is I take a, a math plus English approach to creating strategy and leadership. So we need to understand what, is, what are the financial situations, the accounting, what are the numbers, the cost of acquisition for a client, the lifetime gross profit of a client, the, the churn, you know, clients in versus clients out, what is the value of an average sale, what is your effective hourly rate? These are mathematical questions that I raise right away to get them thinking in different terms. And then from a subjective standpoint, the, sort of the English brain, is I need to them to describe to me how they are different 
and more valuable to serving their clients' needs and pain points than their competitors. If they cannot differentiate themselves uh, in the competitive landscape, then we have to dig in to the story and what makes them unique to wrap around and package that service. Because perceived value is nine times out of 10, the actual problem that I saw from a CMO standpoint. If you increase the perceived value of your service, then you become more profitable. You have less churn, clients and employees leaving versus ones coming on. Um, you can increase the lifetime gross profit. So it's breaking down the barriers of BS to find out what's true and good, and then elevating that which is the most valuable in their company, and then sharing that in their marketing messaging. So what experiences have you had in your career that you would point to as giving you the insights that you just shared with us? A couple of different uh, scenarios. One scenario is I had a client who believed that the Pareto principle does not apply to them whatsoever. They had 24,000 different SKUs or different product types that they sold as a distributor to retail st- shops. And they thought that all of those products were equally valuable. They just weren't marketing them efficiently. What we found is that about 20% of those products made up for over 80% of all the revenue. So we had a plan to take the bottom half of products, put them on discontinued and clearance, create cash flow, lower the price of that, and then take that money to reinvest in the winner products. So it was really making them face that, no, not all of your products are created equally. Some are driving results and some are actually what are, uh, is causing the bank strife. Let's reallocate our attention and focus on the winners and clear out the losers. Uh, that's one example. Another example was with a marketing agency client I had, um, the average price of their client, they had clients stay around forever, but the, the average price or the, the lifetime gross profit of the client was so low because they were trying to sell this client on cost versus on value. So we increased the value that we can imp- increase the price. And in return, those clients were doing success stories, referral programs. They were getting their businesses' uh, results tremendously higher, which had an increase on the brand of that marketing agency uh, because we could prove we did better results versus doing stuff for a low cost. So that increased the gross profit of this agency tremendously. And the last um, example of finding this root problem was had a, had a software client that would serve anyone that would ask for help, but didn't really have an ideal client who they were looking for. So getting them to be brutally honest on, you know, what does that ideal client profile look like for you? And how are you paying attention to them in your current business today? And how do we make more of the ideal clients while keeping the the lower tier clients happy on autopilot and spending less time and effort and energy in there? So refocusing, uh, asking very tough questions, and getting them to buy into not only their own story that they, that's already there latently, but also buying into the future that if you make these changes that don't cost an awful lot of money, but they can create an, a tremendous return uh, down, down the line in the future and really solve for the ideal future you're looking for in market rate. Thank you, Ross. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to learn a bit about you, Ross. You've spent the last 25 or more years working your way up the corporate ladder, achieving success and reward along the way. Whether corporate kicked you to the curb or you walked out the door of your own volition, there is no going back. You're nowhere close to retiring, so you're moving on to your second act as a fractional executive. You're feeling the thrill of freedom mixed with the dread of the unknown. You're not alone. Maven works with the elite 20%, turning the top fractional executive's aspirations into reality easily and quickly. Imagine the right clients needing your genius, chasing you to get it, and happy to pay you for the impact you make. Maven helps you build all aspects of your business to fund your lifestyle without having to work corporate hours. With Maven, market yourself easily, select your clients with purpose, and build a business that leverages your genius 
on your terms, not on someone else's. Reach out to Jay at j.kingley at referabilitymaven.com. Transform your expertise into a prosperous business where you'll make the impact you want with all the freedom, flexibility, and control that you've earned. Welcome back. We're talking to Ross Stockdale, a fractional CMO who helps small and mid-size B2B service companies grow profitably in 12 months or less. Ross, let's find out a bit more about you. Let me start with, well, what makes you great at what you do? So as far as the experiences that enabled me to, to get to where I'm at, I'd have to say I had a pretty interesting upbringing. Um, I was a son of an entrepreneur and the grandson of someone that went from big business to a uh, small business between one and $30 million a year business. So I kind of grew up in my ideal client's market and I went to college to study uh, English with some marketing and psychology and a focus on philosophy. So I really wanted to study when I was uh, you know, going through school, uh, the meta or how to learn or how to communicate and you know, take universal concepts and apply them to you know, finite problems. So that was a bit of my background. When I got into business, I stumbled upon it. Um, you know, I was looking for a job. The job market was not great. So what I did was I just started talking to people in my network that were not doing any online presence or the presence they were was basic was less than table stakes. And I was building them WordPress sites and ranking them on Google. I found that in a few short months, I tripled the small business owners top line revenue through SEO. And I was like, wow, if this isn't something to believe in, I don't know what is. I took my father's business from not on the internet to top four on uh, Google search for his uh, search terms. But at that time, I did not feel the confidence or the world experience to do it all on my own as a consultant. Um, so I took a, an in-house job. And that was a unique experience. I took a 90-plus uh, a year old company that was in my, my ICP today, uh, took them online, so to speak. So in year 94, they experienced around 50% growth in top line revenue with the most profit they ever had. They did an acquisition and uh, they, cl- they sold the most slow moving inventory in the last 20 years uh, within the first three months of me being. There. So I realized that doing a few things differently, you know, it was a lot of trial and error. And maybe for every 10 activities I did, one was a Grand Slam home run. Um, but I got my first taste of you know the SMB mid-market uh, business and I got hooked. So since then, that was a brand position. I took a, a tech startup, took that to about a million a year within five, five months. Um, we tripled the weekly sales within five months just from doing online marketing. Um, I took a brief stint as a cage fighter. So that was all... I only got paid if I sold. So it was personal branding, social media, and trying to juggle being an athlete and uh, you know, an entertainer at the same time. At the time, it didn't feel like it was a good career move, but honestly, today taught me more about marketing and, and what I do than maybe any other experience. After that, I retired and went into the marketing agency world. So I worked within agencies. Long story short there, I went from being an SEO guy all the way up to director of operations, uh, managing the production team of an agency within just a, within one year. Got to the top as what I perceived as my career ladder um, in my ICP and decided that I was going to work for myself because I saw the results I was getting for business owners. And I thought, well, if I'm going to be doing this, I would want to reap the results of my own. I'm willing to take the risk. And I also want the results. So in... Um, at the end of that chapter, I started a private equity firm. And during COVID, I, I lost about $700,000 of secured revenue to be just about broke. So I, I had a great business that I started pre-COVID that all but lost it all um, within a month or two of COVID from being over leveraged as a business owner and being very stressed. So it gives me perspective into a lot of the pain points that I help business owners today 
But at the time, it was my rock bottom. Ross, you are the first cage fighter I think I've ever had as a guest. So tell me, what's next for you over the coming 12 months? I would say what's next for me in the next 12 months is to continue doing what I'm doing as a fractional CMO. I like doing these podcasts like what we're doing today with UJ. I have my own show called The Thunderstock Show. I am getting more involved in networking groups such as Vistage. And I'm expanding my presence and reach on LinkedIn. But what I really want to do in the next 12 months is focus on serving five business owners to get them to financial freedom. Ross, I want to thank you for being a guest on our Fractionals Unplugged show. Be sure to subscribe to both our podcast on all the major platforms and, and on our YouTube channel for our videos. Until next time, make an impact on your clients and family on your terms, securing your independence with the freedom, flexibility, control that you've earned.